start the discussion immediately. So today with us, we will start with Mr. Martin Spotz, who's joining us from the European Commission. Please, Martin. So um, just for the cameras, we're going to sit here and we will start with a short discussion about capital markets. And after that, we will switch to our panel as well, which will dig deeper and explore all the controversial and less controversial questions about capital markets. So, Martin, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. So let's start with, um, with a very simple question about um, capital markets. So you actually used to work on capital markets, CMU in the Commission. And we had a very brief discussion earlier today about the sustainable finance agenda, which is available now on YouTube to watch. Um, we, we record all the sessions for later. And my question would be then, what do you think are the key challenges that we still face with um, capital markets? And what did you see throughout your career as the biggest stumbling blocks that we face? And also potentially maybe some glimmers of hope that um, things can get better. Thank you, Linda. Well, I think that we have plenty of reasons to have hopes. First of all, uh, the agenda of sustainable finance emerged actually as part of the capital markets union agenda. When I started to work, when I started to work on this agenda back in 2017, I was actually asked to work on both. And of course, I had to deliver on both, but I do admit that uh, over the last five years, the agenda that has grown maybe more rapidly and uh, kind of faster is the agenda of sustainability. We have made a good progress on the capital markets union, but it just shows uh, how long-term projects these are. One lesson that I have learned is that this, both agendas require um, not only a strong policy um, re reaction and action, I mean, we as policymakers do need to give a sense of direction, and I hope that we have done it with the objectives of the C Capital Markets Union, and also with the agenda of sustainability, we have the European Green Deal, um, and then also our job is to provide the right tools and create the right environment. But this is not enough. We do need uh, a very strong cooperation and very close dialogue conversation with the markets, ultimately, who are responsible for the actions. And here, I mean, we are really in the hands, ultimately, as policymakers and regulators of the markets. Now, can we say today, after five years, are we happy with where we stand on the capital markets union? Are we happy where we stand on the integration of capital markets and diversification of, of sources, of capital sources? I think that the answer is no. Uh, are we happy where we stand on the sustainability agenda, on the sustainable finance? Are we happy with uh, the proportion of sustainable assets that the financial sector uh, is currently funding? The answer is no. But the hope, and I think that the kind of the sign of a hope is that there is a journey, there is a, there is a di direction of travel. We can, of course, improve the direction of travel. And I think that there are many ways how we can improve it also as policymakers and regulators. But what matters is how really the action. So I mean that we are not only you know, having and delivering great speeches, but we translate and ultimately these, these targets and this, this, these big uh, goals into action. And here, I mean, I would like to say that our job is to articulate the opportunities that the two agendas can reinforce. They, they offer great opportunities how the capital markets union agenda and the sustainability agenda can reinforce each other. I mentioned earlier today, and I will hope not to be that long, that this agenda originally started as greening the finance. I mean, we wanted to make sure that, that ultimately we make sure that the financial sector is managing its own risks and ultimately is allying uh, you know, it, their portfolios with the targets. But over time, we have realized that um, we cannot and we must not work only with the financial sector. Ultimately, this agenda is also about how the financial sector can support the businesses on their sustainability pathways. And here, I think that we have started to talk and we are trying to talk more about um, financing green. So from kind of um, greening finance, which was the original mantra in the beginning, it still remains a very important goal we do need to shift our mindset into um, financing green. But financing green in a way that can ultimately accelerate the agenda. So, I mean, also of the Capital Markets Union. And here I personally believe, and we have not yet exploited uh, these synergies that I talked about, how the, the green agenda and the European Green Deal agenda, the sustainable finance agenda, can accelerate the goals on the CMU. The CMU concept is not a, only a theoretical concept, ultimately, 
it does matter whether a small SME that has a very good plan on sustainability, that is a startup, that would like to use I don't know, a digital, digital, digital technology uh, for an environmental goal, uh, that this SME is not dependent on only on having a dialogue with a banker, and that the banker may be very skeptical. I actually I don't like this because it may not be part of my green asset ratio. Uh, so we do need to kind of articulate what kind of opportunities these SMEs and the small starts up, and in the US actually it works pretty well, how they can tap other sources of capital that they ultimately can fund and uh, sponsor projects that have great potential for positive impact on environmental sustainability, on climate, et cetera. And we have not been good enough in articulating these opportunities. So the whole idea of diversification of, of sources, not only being dependent on the bank sources, but also tapping the capital markets, and not only in the Czech Republic here, I mean, those of you who are representing innovative business, small SMEs, I mean, the idea is that you can also have other opportunities, not only being dependent on, on few banks that are having a dominant position in the Czech Republic, that you can tap other sources of capital as long as your project is sound and good. I have been talking too much. Next question, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think you covered a lot of ground in a relatively very short time. Um, so actually, that brings me to my next question. Uh, you mentioned different types of... Um, ways how you can develop and tap into the capital markets. And across the region, we have heard a lot of conversations about transition-linked instruments. We'll be looking at that on Thursday at the summit um, in terms of what other instruments can banks develop, can business actually issue different types of bonds and debt instruments and so on and so forth. So the interest is there. It just seems, as you mentioned, very slow progress in practice. We have seen the Hungarian Central Bank working on it. We have seen some businesses issuing um, green bonds across the region. So my question also would be, do you see the move of standardization as something that could help this development? So for example, the EU green bond standards um, that you've been working on, where do you see the, the biggest change that could help actually these instruments to become part of the daily picture of finance and how can we scale up further? It, whose responsibility is it? Um, who could drive this process? Do we need um, more proactive banks? Do we need better regulation? Do we need um, more financial literacy? Less fear of debt, potentially? Um, what would be your main takeaways? Thank you, Linda. I think it's all of that. And I think that the responsibility lies with both the public sector and the private sector. Um, uh, we just heard about the, the issuance of the public green debt. We also have one, big one, <laughs> in Europe. Those of you who, who follow these issues very carefully, they, you know that when Europe designed its recovery package, we wanted to make sure that, you know, that the recovery package is as green as possible. It's a beautiful sound. <laughs> I will not spoil it with my voice. <laughs> Um, and we try to make sure that, you know, that uh, a large chunk of the um, uh, European recovery uh, project is actually financed through green bonds. Um, now, this is the public sector, and of course, I mean, also the European Investment Bank that spoke earlier, I mean, they are doing a lot of uh, great stuff, but of course, this is not enough. I mean, we do need to have the private sector, and you mentioned the banks, I mean, the financial literacy, also the, you know, the green bonds that can be issued by the private sector. The potential is th great, it's not yet tapped. Um, you mentioned the standardization. Well, here I think that I should clarify that our idea is not to standardize everything that moves. Uh, we don't believe that we need to have standards for every possible single instrument in the era of sustainability. You mentioned the sustainability linked bonds, you mentioned the transition bonds, there can be different colors of transition bonds. Um, there are plenty of instruments that the markets are developing, and we don't believe that we have to uh, um, regulate every single one that is emerging on the market. Our approach has been so far to create an environment in which whenever these instruments um, emerge, that there is a minimum degree of integrity and uh, also transparency in the market about you know, what is actually behind those instruments. So that when we talk about the, the boom of the, of, the, of the green market, that ultimately, you know, this is also comprehensible and, uh, you know, uh, somewhat credible uh, to the ultimate investors. You mentioned the European Green Bond Standard. This is an exception where we have really strongly believed that we do need to uh, set, uh, you know, the kind of golden standard. What it means uh, for an investor who truly wants to make a significant, substantial contribution to meeting uh, the environmental goals, because the different standards that you know we are seeing, 
they can be provide they can provide for a lot of good, but maybe you know the impact ultimately may not be as significant. And with this European Green Bond standard, we did want to introduce a minimum degree of comfort and actually large degree of comfort to the ultimate investors that what they are ultimately doing is ultimately you know substantially contributing and that's exactly where we have linked the european green bond standard with the taxonomy which is for us a key element because as you know i mean we have been talking a lot about taxonomy taxonomy is for us the key tool that establishes clarity whether a particular economic activity whether the proceeds uh, actually ultimately are sponsoring and funding activities that are aligned with taxonomy so um, the european green bond standard is a very important um, element in our whole strategy. It's currently being negotiated between the Parliament and the Council. Um, I hope that the negotiations will be over soon. And, and those of you who may still believe that this is a too golden standard, too much, you know, it's unreachable, that's not true. I mean, the, golden, the, the Green Bond Standard, I'm sure that Sean will talk about it at length, the Green Bond Standard can be used even by the company that, again, doesn't generate a single euro. I already mentioned that example as long as you have a plan, you know, how you, let's say, have a capital expenditure for an activity that is ultimately meeting the criteria in the taxonomy. So it's, a, it's an instrument that for us, I mean, will bring um, quite a big change. And uh, we ultimately hope that, you know, this will not be an inspiration only for the private sector. Thank you. Um, yes, I think we definitely also need uh, much more on the public sector side and a lot more activity there. Um, which we're not um, often seeing in the region. But I think it's also important to bring people to these conversations, which is so great um, that you were able to travel and join us um, on quite a short notice. So I will just ask one last question be before we switch to our panelists, who will um, dig a lot deeper. So in terms of the private capital in the region, um, we have heard a lot of discussions earlier today during the panels and also... Um, We've heard from the capital markets associations here saying that, well, actually private capital is already trying to figure out how to tap into this green opportunity. Um, what could we do better to do a bit more financial, green financial literacy to improve people's mindsets about um, sustainable finance? Because having worked on this topic now for two years, uh, we are still seeing a lot of people who see this as irrelevant or nice to have, not must to have. And we always argue that whichever way you look at it, um, it will be about profitability and about profit margins and competitiveness and just genuinely, it's not about doing nice things or hugging trees or... Um, saving wildlife it's also about just the fundamentals the natural capital that the systems rely on and how uh, you are going to have to disclose your impact you mentioned double materiality so in this way what do you think should be the messaging what we can do to actually help you more from the region um, because isfc is an independent think tank it works across the ce region and we have been trying to focus on educational and communication activities but we also do some research. So what needs to be also researched more? Because maybe if we can crunch some more exciting numbers, maybe then more people will jump on board. Oh, Linda, we always need more research, and I agree on that. Um, but we always will have research. I think that the, <laughs> the trouble that we have is that there is not enough connection between, again, the political goals, uh, you know, the, the, the speeches, I mean, the ultimate objectives, with what needs to happen on the ground. Therefore, there is no accident that last year when we updated our strategy on sustainable finance, um, I already mentioned the different priorities, but the second one was inclusiveness. And the, what we meant by inclusiveness, I mean, in a minute, is to make sure that we also connect this agenda uh, to the stakeholders that have not been connected sufficiently well. And here I also obviously you know, need to reflect on the communication by the commission, by the public authorities uh, at large how we can connect this agenda to um, the retail investors, to the SMEs um, and other, uh, again, stakeholders that may be maybe a little bit micro from the, from the kind of you know, big policy macro perspective, but actually matter at most, because especially in some countries and especially in the Czech Republic and Central and Eastern Europe, um, the excess of capital and sustainable capital to SMEs, I mean, you know, Okay, there will be some improvements for sure by the banking sector, but we cannot count on that fully. So we do need to identify some ways 
uh, financial literacy is one uh, aspect. Um, but there are many other stakeholders than only your think tank. I mean, that, that should really help here. And here we need to connect all stakeholders here. <coughs> um, financial advisors. Um, I mentioned also the retail investors. Maybe I should say that we did already introduce a requirement by which now um, advisors, financial advisors, are required uh, to ask a question if you are retail investors and you are going to approach your financial advisor. Now the EU law requires that you should be uh, asked a question after you go through your risk and return profile. By the way, do you have any sustainability preferences? Uh, by the way, I mean, at the end, for the timing, it's at the end. And then if, as long as you say yes, uh, then there should be an appropriate follow-up. And through the fiduciary the duty requirements, you know, this should ultimately trigger an action. Well, you know, this will take some time, but this is how we think, I mean, can, uh, we can mobilize retail investors. But we talked about the SMEs, and I don't want to have a very lengthy discussion on SMEs. We can have a lengthy debate the whole evening. But here, I mean, we are still not uh, there in resolving the conundrum where some of the SMEs or some stakeholders are arguing don't put any regulatory burden on SMEs, and that's also the approach that we have taken so far. We have been very careful about not uh, imposing especially disclosure requirements and very difficult disclosure requirements on SMEs for, for good reasons. But at the same time, we hear from investors, look, I mean, if I don't get the information, I mean, how can I know that, you know, I, there is an opportunity, there is, there is something. So I, I, I do believe that we do need a deeper conversation how, what we can do more about this second pillar, this inclusiveness. I think that the goal is there. I mentioned that the role of policymakers is to set out the goals. But I don't think that we have the right solution yet. I mean, there, there has to be a kind of uh, ultimately a mixture of, of solutions, and we will need you. I mean, we cannot run this agenda from Brussels. That's 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 only <laughs> that's that's very clear. Fantastic, thank you. I think with that we will probably close this part. Um, and I think it's a very interesting message to send also about the SMEs because. I think a lot more can be done by each of the stakeholders with a little bit more of a proactive approach, not just waiting and reacting, but actually trying to understand how you can benefit, how you can utilize the momentum behind the Green Deal. And also we do have um, an energy price spike. So that is a real issue for a lot of businesses. So that shows that those ones that are trying to decarbonize and trying to figure out how to save energy actually are now benefiting. So it shows a very clear example of uh, how that can be beneficial um, also for business. But thank you again so much, uh, Martin. And now I will give floor to uh, Mr. Razvan Putukaro, who's gonna run the rest of the session. Uh, thank you so much. Oh. He's <laughs> no, no, not alone. But uh, just a quick note, because we have an overfilled room, I will join Martin over there, and then we have a few seats opening up because the speakers are joining the seats at the Front. So please uh, welcome and grab a seat at the front. And Razvan, the floor yes. is yours. Thank you, Linda. Uh, please, my panel. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for the invitation. It's very nice being here with you this evening. It has been uh, quite a day. Uh, with a lot of uh, uh, with a lot of ideas, a lot of brainstorming, uh, I may say it was a, a great day for sustainability, and we're going to continue it uh, further with our guest today. Uh, happy to see you, by the way. <laughs> uh, and uh, so we have tonight or this evening we have Shan Kidney, which is a CEO of Climate Bond Initiative, an expert in uh, green bond and a uh, uh, member of various advisory boards, very close to the uh, sustainability and finance area. We have Helena Horska, chief economist, Raiffeisen Bank, well-known banker and uh, economist, previously working with the Ministry of Finance as well. A little bit. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> uh, Martin Kominek, he's our representative for the uh, investment uh, a professional investor. He is a uh, founder and managing partner or of uh, Smokestake and uh, previously a member of the uh, board of Tendom. 
Uh, and last but not least, uh, Theodor Kojano, it's Associate Professor in uh, Energy Finance, University of Edinburgh, and founder of uh, Romanian Sustainability and Finance Association. Well done, Theodor. <laughs> uh, our panel today, it's about capital markets in CE, and it will touch some, some topics which was quite common during today's discussions. It was about capital, right? About public capital and about private capital, okay? How they mix, how they finance, uh, how we can the capital can reach to uh, medium to small size companies and how the investors can be convinced to invest in a sustainable economy, sustainable business, okay? So my dear panelists, my dear colleagues, let's see how we can unleash this power of capital and what are the challenges that we are facing in, in, in CE? So, Sean, you are the first here, so. <laughs> Is this on? Yes, fantastic. <clears throat> well, look, we know some basics, right? We know we've got a vast challenge. It's worth noting the challenge, by the way. The challenge is not only uh, repowering the EU in the context of the war in Ukraine, which is obviously a central core agenda, getting off gas, getting off oil really fast. It's also our 2030 outlook, if you've read the IPCC report, utterly terrifying of a few weeks ago. Utterly terrifying, 50% reduction in emissions we have to achieve in the next eight years, or else we are toast, frankly. We will see consecutive days of 50 degrees Celsius in summer in Prague, and it will not be pleasant, because the buildings here are not adapted to it. <laughs> not to mention the loss of, of Czech winters and so on. Uh, but the worst thing is, of course, the impact on the poor around the world, the implosion of economies, the wars, the pandemics. You know, we had climate change in the 1600s. We said two degrees cooling. We killed off so many American Indians in the 1500s that the forest regrowth in the Amazon sucked so much carbon out of the atmosphere, according to research from Stanford University, that we saw climate change. And what did we experience in every country in the world? We experienced war. Note that this war over the border there is a petro war. It's a petro state dictator using petroleum and gas revenues from Europe to finance a war in Ukraine. That's a petro state war. We saw famine and we saw plague, pan pandemics. In the 1600s, we lost a third of the world's population. The population decreased by a third. And it wasn't just the 30 years war in Germany, which killed off 50% of the people in Germany and in, in Moravia and Bohemia as part of that. This is what we can expect this century, everyone, if we don't address the worst of climate change. So bear that in mind. That's the challenge. Now, the reason why I state that is this has become common sense knowledge now amongst the investment community. In the investors, with the investors I speak to now, there is now no doubt about the shape of the future. It will be clean and green. Governments are beginning to act. The Biden Climate Summit last year drove this home on every major economy including Europe, uh, committed to 2030 targets, not 2050, 2030. Will they all get there? Investors think they will get there. The question is when. It's a speed issue. It's not when. In other words, the tsunami of change is now confirmed. The question mark is who's going to be able to survive and who's going to be able to benefit, to seize the opportunities. So when we look at Czech industry, which is trapped in a 20th century paradigm, and resisting change so often on these issues, we have to say, hang on, we've got some fantastic things in Czechia and in Central European countries. We have in Czechia especially export-oriented economy. We have 150 years, 200 years of industrial exports. This is not an insular economy like France is or Germany, or Germany has been in the past. It is an economy to survive and exports. So the question is, how do we take advantage of this change in the world economy and make it work? Industry has to change. Electric vehicles are coming, folks. Old-fashioned vehicles, they're gone in 10 years. We won't have them, but it doesn't just apply to that. It applies to everything Czechia produces, and it applies to everything Hungary produces and everything Poland produces. So that's what's happening. We know that the capital wants to go green. We've got a proof of concept, folks, green bonds. Speak to our friends at uh, Seska Sporitelna about their First ever Czechia green bond, half a billion dollars. They got three times over subscription, three basis points benefit. Like, folks, this is real. 
This is not some kind of abstract idea. And, and I have to have a share a bit of gossip. We are giving an award to Seska Sporikdana in a few weeks' time because they were the first, the pioneer issue in this market. And there'll be some media around that. We need a lot more green finance. That green bonds, they're just a way of labelling what's, what's green and getting some advantages, linking up the investors. But they are a very powerful tool. It's now a market globally of $1.8 trillion US. And it's going to grow 50% to 70% this year. Folks, this is a symptom of the investor appetite. And they're all oversubscribed. Even the European Commission's 10 billion euro first green bond was 10 times oversubscribed. The demand is there. We need to take advantage of the demand. What do we need? Well, we need more demonstration issuers. Czechia, where is the sovereign? Hungary's done one. Serbia's done one. Poland's done one. Lithuania's done one. What's going on in Czechia? What's going on in Slovakia? What's going on in Romania? We need to fix that, right? But of course, the city of Prague could also be issuing green bonds to finance as Metro, et cetera, et cetera. We're doing some work on the architecture. Taxonomy is part of the architecture. Taxonomy is part of clarity. It's a common language across Europe, across the world. And, don't, and, and understand, we are now working with China, with ASEAN, with countries around the world on a common approach to taxonomy through the International Plan Platform on Sustainable Finance, again, led by DG FISMA. The taxonomy is a tool. It isn't perfect yet. Oh, I will say that. I'm one of those people who will say, we've got to do a bit more work this year. I've been bending Martin's ear about that for the last few days. He's on side. It will get better. Nadia's in there has written a fantastic helped write a fantastic report from the platform, which will be implemented, Nadia. Absolutely, <laughs> certainly, I'm sure of it. So expect improvements. Understand, it's like designing the engine of a car. When you're in the design phase, of course it's complicated. What do you expect? But once it's done, you get in, especially an electric car, press the button and drive. You never need to worry about the engine. This is what next year will be like for you. So it's critically important, this common language, Markets thrive on rules. They will grow on rules. Investors are saying, give us rules. So give us a bit of patience on that. But in the meantime, the critical thing I want to leave you with is the opportunity in Central Europe for issuance in a market that is already booming to take advantage of international investor appetite. It's not just renewable energy, folks. Of course, that's great. And we will see a lot more thanks to the policy changes because the war in Ukraine is happening. It's also grids, everything to do with electrical grids qualifies under the EU taxonomy. It's also green property. We could be issuing bonds against green property, like we've already seen from Siska Sporitelna, who did green bonds and green energy. We could be doing metro lines, water infrastructure, industrial investments, and so on. There's so much. It's a huge agenda and a huge universe. And I'm just going to say, Investors that I speak to, and we have all the world's largest investors as Club and Bonds partners, are saying, give us more. Where are the deals? Give me deals. They recognise that green bond issuers and people who are disclosing green investments have less risk associated with them. If they're not working on the green transition, they are seen to be companies that will be overwhelmed by the tsunami. The tsunami is coming. If they are working on the green transition, they've got a chance at least of surviving tsunami and they might make money out of it. Hey, tell the world. It's going to be fantastic. Sean, you covered a lot of topics. <laughs> Very fast. <laughs> Helena, a, a banking or perspective from a, from a banker. Uh, yeah, hello. First of all, thank you for uh, having me here. Now it's very tough to continue <laughs> with <the> so uh, <laughs> excitement and entertainment, I would say. Uh, back to the floor, <laughs> maybe I'm back to the conservative banking. I should say, maybe look on the Raiffeisen. I think Raiffeisen was the first Indeed. Czech uh, bank who uh, issued the green bond and was six times oversubscribed. So uh, we should discuss later on, yes, <laughs> on the garden, who, will, who, will, who, was, or who was the first. So uh, don't worry, we will discuss it. Uh, so uh, again, the question was uh, if the public and the private sector should uh, uh, should cooperate, definitely. And the question, who, who should be the first? Both. 
<laughs> and my, uh, my also the question is, yeah, uh, I agree that uh, not only the Czech economy, C uh, countries are ahead of the uh, big uh, transition. And it's not only about the energy. Uh, it's not only about uh, what we are producing here, that still we are uh, the contractor of German economy, of France or EU economy. So if uh, the German owners or Austrian owners would like to see here more green production, more green uh, economy, they should invest into us also. Yeah. So it's not only about the human capital, uh, it's also about the quality of the investment that the companies are doing here. But definitely the pu public uh, role is uh, huge here. And I know, uh, I think in this uh, case, the Czech Republic needs to do more. So yes, uh, uh, here in Czech Republic, the private company start uh, be to be more active. Uh, we see already the uh, demand from our uh, clients because they see and they would like to see the investment opportunities into the green investment or sustainability investment, ESG so-called. Yes, and this is also changing the role of the banking. Be aware of that because ESG is not only about the green, uh, sustainable, but it's also about the governance. And in this sense, we know at least from the experience from Raiffeisen in Vienna, that if you would like to follow the rules for ESG, you should be, as an investor, very active in governments of the companies into which you are investing. And in this case, you need to have more people, more experts on governing the companies that you are investing in. And also it's demand for human capital. So in this sense, yes, we should cooperate, and I see good opportunities for our region, for our Czech economy, uh, to do more, but be aware that this transition is very complex one. It's not about the banking, not only about the industry, but uh, it's also about the human capital and our knowledge, because we will need to have a more expert on this side, and I see the lack of that. Martin? <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for having me, and uh, it would be difficult to, to follow after Helena and, and John, that's for sure. Uh, I, I would try to take it a little bit from like private investor and from the private equity perspective. You know, Sean mentioned uh, a lot of things that I would like to touch, but not sure if I would be successful. But anyways, I'm not, still not sure, sure about the cars, but uh, sustainability is a real thing. Definitely, there is no question about it. And uh, maybe, you know, um, first of all, I think it's about the people, you know, about their ma minds, about uh, their feel of responsibility. Because at the end of the day, and I, I had a great discussion a um, couple of minutes ago with, with Martin here, who gave you a wonderful speech. And, uh, you know, he, he asked me what they should do to support, uh, you know, the private investors, private equity, and all the kind of, le let's, uh, let's call it, um, environment where we are living and where we are investing. and. I told him, I don't know, because when you take, for example, the um, energy thing, you know, uh, many years before when solar and wind uh, made a thing, you know, you can imagine that a lot of big Czech investors were looking for, you know, and who will be buying the coal, who will be producing the coal, you know, and at the end of the day, they are pretty successful nowadays to still doing the coal and enjoying that, you know, uh, against the, all the main, I would say, I, I wouldn't say a right, but definitely a sustainability way. And uh, all of you know that, you know, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Poland, were based on coal, like for many years and partially and, or maybe majority, they are still. But, you know, uh, w what to do with that? Because in, in Czech Republic, Slovakia, here, you know, 
there is not push of institutional investors when you compare it to the big, big markets like London, uh, US or developed Europe, you know, you are having investors and your investors are institutionals like Raiffeisen Bank, Erste and all the others in Czech Republic. Let's call it private equity market. It's pretty small, pr pretty fragmented and majority of the kind of big guys are investing their own private money, you know, and so they don't have any push from, uh, from upside to invest, you know, sustainable, uh, in a sustainable way. They don't have a push for, uh, for um, let's call it um, inclusionness, what, what Martin mentioned, and also for diversity. And I think that we have to show, show them the way, you know, that it works and it can be even much more profitable. And in terms of the risk reward, you know, at the end of the day, you can be sus sustainable and at the very the same time, simultaneously, you still can deliver much better IRR than you would do with a coal uh, and with all the others very, uh, very emissions uh, affected uh, energy sources. So I think that's, that's uh, from, uh, from my opening and uh, definitely we will get deeper. From professional investors, so there is return together with sustainability, yeah? Definitely, definitely. <laughs> it's not good. either or, it's definitely together. Good. <laughs> Wonderful. Does this work? Perfect. Um, so I'm Teodor Kojano and I have, I'm, I'm very privileged. Uh, one, because I, I get to serve on the EU platform of sustainable finance and learn from the likes of Sean, Nadia, work with Martin and a lot of people who are working really hard to, to design some pieces of critical regulation that, uh, that I think will, uh, will be very impactful. I'm also a uh, Romanian and as, uh, as, as you've highlighted, we've, we've started ROSIF, so uh, we're, we're moving into Central and Eastern Europe and we're trying to understand how how we can be a catalyzer for change. Uh, and I'm also an academic, which means I get a lot of free time to do these two things, right? So, so, so you can see I'm, I'm privileged. Um, I'd just like to establish a bit of a, a baseline, and maybe I'm not starting from an optimistic baseline, but I promise you that we'll, we'll get to an you know, uplifting message uh, in the end. Uh, we are in a Central Eastern European region that has lobbied very, very hard for um, for gas and nuclear to be included in the taxonomy. Nuclear is not as, um, I, th I think, problematic from the point of perspective of climate change, but gas certainly is. Uh, in retrospect, as Sean mentioned, with uh, the, the war in Ukraine, it was a pretty bad idea and short-sighted. Imagine what we could have done if we would have already invested it or we had the idea that actually having the energy independence that the renewables could give us, that the good storage and the grid system would allow us, wouldn't that uh, you know, put us into a very comfortable situation right now? We're not there, but I think we've learned our lesson and we're working towards it. We're also uh, in a region, and again, I, I'm probably speaking more about my country of Romania that I uh, know more about. We're in a, we're in a situation where uh, not just sustainable finance education is not, but financial education in general is, is not there. Uh, we don't have a culture as it is in, in my, uh, you know, let's say adoptive country in the UK, uh, in Scotland, where people have been investing in stock markets since, you know, the, the 30s, the 40s. Uh, it, it, they have a long culture of actually knowing how financial instruments work. They have it a topic of their din dinner tables. That has never been a topic as part of my upbringing, and now I'm, as I said, privileged to actually work in, and shape sustainable finance legislation, but we've never talked about it. And that's really the case of, I would say, 70, 80% of people. I think newer generations right now are being much quicker, information is flowing much, much faster, but education, and again, on broad financial issues is not that uh, there yet. And that means that sustainable finance education is not there yet. And it's not just for ordinary people, it's also for um, the companies uh, working in the region. We've been doing a lot of work, and again, also credit to Linda and to everyone who's doing a lot of work and putting these events together to explain what, for example, the taxonomy does, how it works, what companies can claim. So 
it's probably not surprising to know that the, I've spoken to, to numerous companies that didn't understand, for example, that although their company doesn't fit into the NACE sector, their main primary activity doesn't fit, for example, a mining company is not yet covered under the taxonomy. We are working on it. Uh, but a mining company can already claim, for example, renewable energy capex if they wanted to put, uh, you know, to, to power their, let's say, electric conveyors with renewable energy. They can already do that. And yet they don't know that. Uh, and it's not just mining companies, food and beverage companies, auto companies, and so on. And I think, again, coming back to the theme of education and communication, we need this ground level understanding of how big this opportunity is how actually the taxonomy and this regulation is not a threat, is about the clarity that Sean spoke, is the clarity of the opportunity. It's also a scientific clarity because we have a scientific uh, problem that needs to be solved technically. You know, at the global rev level, we need to bring emissions down and, and we need to, to, to make that uh, message very clear. Um, it's, we also need, I think, education about the theory of change. Uh, again, unlike in Western Europe, where we have uh, large asset owners, we, you know, who do engagement with large companies, here we're talking about SMEs. You know, we're talking about a very strong banking culture, and we're talking about pressure points that, well, we don't really know what the pressure points are yet. We we have a clue. We know we need to engage with uh, governments. Uh, but politicians, I think, will care more and more as actually their voters would demand of it. And again, I get to a point of education. And so this is a very long-term process. So, I, yeah, I, I'm thinking, you know, what, what is, I, I, I don't think, uh, I think Linda is not here. I, I just wanted to thank her personally, but I'll thank her at the end. I think really the, the key thing is that we all get together around the uh, Central Eastern European uh, region, across Europe, across the world. We educate ourselves so that we can make good decisions. And I'll probably stop there. Thank you. So unleashing the capital comes with education. Yeah, education from, <laughs> from entrepreneurs, from new generation. So they are all tied up. Um, you know, yes, yes, or no. deals, <laughs> deals, illuminate the topic. You get half a dozen great green deals away and everyone wakes up, including the minister, because suddenly it's real, it's no longer abstract. So the education comes with real business. You can do as much education you like as abstract and it's a waste of time, honestly. Yeah. So what we need and what we really need in this market is real deals, your deal, we didn't count yours as a full green. You were sustainable, I think. But we're going to talk about that afterwards and have a yeah, real yeah, yeah. Uh, a couple of hard <laughs> vodkas about it. Um, uh, we, 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 we trust the other, the other bank felt uh, addressed the green criteria better, I'm going to say. But it doesn't matter because your deal was fantastic that it came out. Yeah. And the truth is when it comes to sustainability, we need headlines in the newspapers about how this is actually happening and we need people to see the palpable benefits that like Gryphuson got and, and uh, Seska Sporotano got and then everyone will just follow and they will learn. We won't need to run classes because everyone will be online looking up this stuff and figuring out what's the taxonomy, quick, how can I make, make something of this market? So I'm, this is again a beseeching of all of you, figure out a deal, get us a deal. You're going to get benefits and this will make the market boom. Remember that this isn't just a one-off trying to push the market. The world is changing. The world is changing. It is going to, in the words of investors I speak to, going to go green. The only question is how, where and what speed. We can take advantage of that. We can get ahead of that tsunami by getting a few deals to the market and then educating the market. So that's, that's what I mean. Okay, so we add great deals together with education, yeah, and we have unleashing of capital. Is this better? And if anyone wants to talk about how to get a deal out, <laughs> let's have a conversation <laughs> after this, out there in the garden. And success for cases, <laughs> the real one. Yeah, exactly. Yes, it's for and, cases. You know, and yeah. the banks who've done a fantastic job yeah. of getting the market going yeah. so far. Yeah. But all your clients now need to do stuff. Because this is the capital. So uh, we are, as the economist, saying the capital is the engine of the economy. So if we would like to start uh, the so-called ESG engine, 
we should have the capital in this case. And, and what, are the, you know, what are the means, what are the instruments and the approaches that can be used? You know, we started the conversation in, before the panel, and you also mentioned about the quality of the investment, and you know, what are these, what yeah, are the approaches? Uh, this, uh, I will just uh, shift the conversation ahead because we mentioned here that uh, the, uh, like the financial uh, literacy or ESG literacy is very important. And in this case, I think the financial institution, banks, may, uh, may do a great job because we uh, start to learn our clients, uh, or we, uh, yeah, this is the positive experience, start to learn our clients what is the ESG investment. So we can offer, and they did, uh, uh, very nice uh, offers uh, like to invest into ESG financial funds, uh, some investment funds, because uh, at the beginning it's very risky to invest directly uh, in such specific instrument. Nobody knows what doesn't mean, what, what's the risk. But if the banks uh, offer you some ESG portfolio or it's some ESG investment fund, then you can, would say, redistribute the risk uh, over the investment population, would say. And the people start to learn, okay, ESG is something that it's not harm me. It's something that it's positive. And I see not only the... Uh, the positive impact, but also some yield. Uh, so it's very nice because you can see that, this, uh, that, uh, that it may have a positive impact on economy or on the environment, but also you see the yield from it. So you can be part of the story, of the transition. So in this case, I think the ESG literacy is also very nice to do through the real investment and see uh, the opportunities of investment into ESG funds. So in this way, I think uh, the banks may do a better job. Do you uh, agree uh, or do you not agree? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I'm going to expand it further. Yeah. Because I'm going to say for retail investors, there's something more else you could do, which is you could offer green term deposits for people in, in Prague, for example, so that they could actually be offering, they could get retail products of all sorts which should work exactly like a green bond, same principle, and many others. Or you could offer transition advisory lending for major companies who are starting to look at this. You know, I, 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 the, the largest bank in Australia I met recently, this, the top management, and they really surprised me when I walked into the room. They said, we're now deciding that our bank, our primary responsibility is to help our clients transition, all our clients. They wanted advisory services, they wanted guidance in the form of taxonomy, and they were going to make the capital available and then bundle up into green bonds or transition bonds afterwards. So we could see we could see more from your bank, which you've done a lot so far, but there's, there's, there's a lot more the banks can do. Does everyone agree there's a lot more the banks can do? Of course <laughs> there is. <laughs> and we but can also... Doing. Uh, y y yes, but, you know, you know we need to think. Enough. We've got to transition our economies, folks, in eight years. We need to cut emissions... 50% globally in eight years. They went up last year 6%. We have an extraordinary challenge. This means the face of industry across CEO, so the, the central European countries, are going to have to change, and they have to start right now. All CapEx decisions need to be put through a filter of what's the transition going to look like. All OPEX decisions need to be start assessed on the basis of how, this, how the world's going to change the future. But it, if we make the change, remember this is also going to be the longest, the biggest Keynesian stimulus in history, what we're going through. It is going to be a long boom. We are going to see incredibly cheap energy like we have never seen before. Forget this high energy cost. This is coal we're talking about and gas, which is giving us the high energy cost. Renewables are going to drive the cost down very quickly. So many things are going to come together. I'm just going to say we want to be on that train. We don't want to be sitting on the side watching the train head off. And, you know, you've started the process of being on the train. Just get all your clients on as well. Yeah, of course, we are doing because uh, you might know that in RBI, the, the fastest growing investment portfolio is exactly in, in ESG. And it's uh, also the opportunity for us, and we are offering to our Raiffeisen Czech Republic clients to be the part of the story. And we know that the, the, this part is the fast growing uh, part of the market. 
if you look on the numbers, uh, on number of uh, issuance uh, each year, it's uh, multiplying. So it's not only like a couple of uh, percentage points, but it's double or three times higher. But of course, uh, this is the opportunity. But uh, as we mentioned, first of all, we need to give the people uh, like the safety net that uh, this investment is a part of the story and it's not only ESG, uh, the uh, politics, but also they can see the yields from the investment. And the retail investment, especially in RBI, is the really the fastest growing uh, part of the uh, uh, collective investment. And we see, uh, especially between the women, as we are speaking about the diversity, yeah, yeah. So about women investment and young people, so young generation is strongly invested or it's strongly interested in uh, this kind of uh, investment. So, so it's so, so are you saying good. Women, women are leading the way? Uh, yeah, we are. Uh, we are leading again. You yeah. know, in crisis, the women are the power. Women are yes, pressing the society to move ahead. While the men are saying, uh, "Okay, we will should wait and see." what will happen. It was seen in COVID in Czech Republic. The woman and the woman led the power to move ahead. <laughs> I can certainly agree that. Um, in, in a D difficult to comment it, but I would say, you know, it's uh, with the women and men, it's very the same like with uh, investments. You know, there is a good investment and a bad investment. It doesn't matter if it's ESG or not. And very the same with uh, once you're having, you know, you're trying to set up the great board for your company, for your investments and for your, let's call it institutional investors, you know, you want to be sure that you have the best possible board, you know, and it does mean that it's, um, there is some diver diversity, but it doesn't mean that you are pushing the women in, into the board. You know, they are still human beings, and regardless, they are uh, women or, or the men, but you are trying to, to find uh, the best ones. So, the yeah, <laughs> so. <laughs> so, yeah, so. The question of the quality, you know, if you are like trying to find somebody to the board, and you are seeking somebody who will work uh, 20 hours per day, and uh, seven uh, days per week, then it's wrong uh, assumption. And uh, you know, if, if you would like have a woman or a woman, uh, somebody who is uh, the uh, person who is uh, opening like mid and long term issues and not only following the one year results, then it's right. But if you have the woman there in a board, at the board, that uh, it's only the woman and you, uh, you exactly fulfill the, uh, some internal uh, criteria, it's wrong. But what I'm saying uh, that the women, in, especially women in a crisis, are able to see the light in the tunnel because they know how to do that. And I think this is kind of, would say, diversity that we need to have. Sorry, but we changed the topic. <laughs> because, you know, when we're talking about ACG, it's not only sustainability, it as covers everything. Governance, you know, it's called social. It's, it's all of it. And I, I'm glad that you know, we're touching this subject because I think it's, no, this is what we have to, to, to understand. Yeah, yeah, please, yeah. I, I, I spoke, <laughs> I I spoke a lot. <laughs> I spoke a lot, but I just want to say that we have six reporters. Quick, but before Linda comes uh, back, because she's very tight on the schedule. <laughs> okay, no, sure. I don't know. I mean, we have six reporters on the platform on sustainable finance. Nadia is one of the five women we have. And the reason why we have appointed women is that, as exactly we just heard, I mean, we do need to see the light at the end of the tunnel, and Nadia is doing a great job. <laughs> and the others as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Also, from uh, my, my partner asked me, why is it that in Romania, anything that we've done substantially well, also on the sports side, it's all women, our handball team, our gymnast team. And uh, I had to recognize because, you know, they, uh, they get things done. So uh, uh, I, I'm delighted to also have been uh, just inspired also by Nadia and by the, by the many uh, mentors uh, that actually uh, have taken me under their wing and said, hey, this is the, the, the true way in sustainable finance. And actually, a lot of the pioneers, Sean, also in the field, if you also think of Christiana Figueres, uh, who have made the, um, you know, the 2015 Paris Agreement, uh, 
I think there's, there's a lot of inspiration that, that we should draw from. But I, I also wanted to get a, a bit back to what you said, Sean, on the new infrastructure side. And this is something we've, div we've debated in the platform uh, about new issuance, new capex versus alignment of our current activities. And I really think also for our region, we need to emphasize this new capex. We need new infrastructure. Yes, we need to retrofit our buildings, but ultimately, really, I, it, it, we can't really take our cars and just simply put an electric engine in them. You know, we really need a lot of new infrastructure. And actually, for the new infrastructure, as, as we also know, Martin, the taxonomy is not really a problem, not even a reporting problem, because you can set up your new project to be taxonomy aligned because you're building it from the start. Um, and so, f industry won't be concerned that they cannot do it because it's actually much, much easier. It's really hard to look at our current infrastructure and say, is it really taxonomy aligned? Can I really refinance my debt? Particularly in private markets. Nadia will tell you in the break how difficult it is to, to do it in public markets. Uh, and so I, I really think we should focus on this new infrastructure because that's, that's how we actually solve the problem, not by refinancing what we've already done and saying, actually, in retrospect, we've done well. It was green. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, actually, you know, it's, it's on this part of financing, you know, I think this is Sean has more to say because on this, you know, he's an expert in green bonds and, you know, we have now... Uh, in Europe, there is Europe, uh, the green bond standards, a voluntary one, which has to be released uh, this year. So, Sean, if you could comment uh, a bit more on, for example, what is different in CE compared to other regions, because you have you no know, broad view on this in terms of you know, green bond issues, you know, specifics, and what, what these new standards, voluntary so far, brings about, and how, how do you see it? Look, the standard is just enshrining the protocols that are already in the market. It's not a departure, it is not a revolution, it's just crystallizing. You know, your bond will qualify. Your bond will qualify, that's easy. Um, the new area of work is the taxonomy, which is fleshing out compliance issues, qualification issues to better understand, putting aside the work we're still doing in that. So that's the really critical thing. So I, I'm not worried about the standard, it's just gonna simply come in and everyone's gonna use it because they're already doing that now anyway, largely things like getting a second opinion or an independent review of your green criteria. It's pretty straightforward. Can you more or not? It'll help the standardization that's okay. becoming a norm in the market. The real issue is how do we find the opportunities, how do we make the opportunities work in CE area. This has been a low area of issuance, although the Polish government did get in and issue the world's first sovereign green bond, mm -hmm. thanks to advice from HSBC. They just beat the French to the incredible annoyance of the French, so much so that the French excluded HSBC from their underwriter league table as a result of supporting the polls. I was so annoyed. <laughs> um, but that's okay. That's the point of what we're trying to create, competition to get there. And now we've had a lot of other issues in the area. The real issue, I think Theo's right, is how do we create the new infrastructure and the new investments? That's what we have to look. And green bond markets, which allows you to refi, by the way, you can refinance assets. The Prague Metro could be refinanced in the green bond market and qualify which would get instruments going and allow investors participation, grow engagement and build appetite for new projects. So remember that, so you can get started on refinancing. That's important to note. But of course, the big job is the new infrastructure. So the new high-speed rail that's being connected, Berlin, Prague and so on, is an example of infrastructure we need. But it's so much more than that. You know, if we look at where emissions are coming in, in Czechia and Hungary and Romania and Poland, of course it's energy. We need to switch. Well, we need to switch anyway. I'm not worried about keeping on using coal for a few more years because I've discovered that gas is actually only marginally lower emissions than coal because for the last 20 years, we have been ignoring the fugitive emissions from Wellhead in Russia where they're leaking like a sieve and methane is 84 times the potency of CO2 when it leaves the atmosphere. So it's a disaster. So I'm really glad now that we've killed off the idea of transitioning to gas in Central Europe. Keep the coal mines going for a few more years if necessary while we rapidly shift to renewables and other kinds. That's what's going to happen. And in the Ukraine rebuilding program that's currently being designed now, there is a huge renewable energy component. They have massive land and irradiation and there's a huge green hydrogen component which could fuel Czech industry. 
across the border. So there's stuff we can do now. But locally, transport, property, grid connections, we have to quadruple electrification of countries in Eastern Europe in the next 30 years. That's a lot of grid investments going forward. And then industrial. Martin made the point, a really important point earlier, about transition. In this market, it's not just about what you've got and what you can refinance. It's what you're planning to do in the next five years. Now, don't get me wrong. No wash, no weak ambition here. We need serious, substantial ambition in line of where the taxonomy is going. But if you have a five-year plan or a six-year plan to make the transition, that can be recognised. That can be supported. Bonds, other kinds of debt issued can be qualified. So for every industry that looks really polluting now, what's required is simply a plan to transition. And we're beginning to see now incentives to further lower the cost of capital as interest rates inch up, and check here especially. We are now seeing Christine Lagarde's conversations about green quantitative easing. The Hungarian Central Bank issued risk-weighting differentials for green property bonds. We've seen ar uh, around the world, the People's Bank of China give 1% cheaper capital if you post green bonds, a liquidity lending window, the central bank, and so on. And we have a live discussion in Brussels now about further incentives coming through. You can already get some incentives. You know, if, there's, if you're a governed body in Hungary or Czechia or Poland or Slovakia, you can get DG reform cash to help you prepare a green bond program, about a quarter of a million euros available if you apply. That program still exists. So there is already support available to make this. And that program can help you figure out what your transition plan should look like. I mean, that's public sector, admittedly. But on the private sector, the EBRD in many countries is providing technical assistance support. Look, there's so much help we can get. All we need now is the willingness, the ambition to embrace what is a certain future and start preparing for it and get the investors in. The past is no guide to the future, folks. We now need, and this is the words of Frank Elderson, who was the chairman of the net worth grid in the financial system until recently. They're associated with 100 central banks around the world. The past is no guide to the future anymore. We now need to look at the kinds of scenarios that are likely going forward and the scenarios that will make us more money. So speaking about more money and the private sector and mostly you know, on, the, on the private equity, Martin, uh, I've seen lately a growing interest, you know, from the private uh, fund, private equity funds, when they acquired targets, you know, they start asking about, you know, on their environmental footprint or some experts on corporate governance, but still there are some, how can I say, very, uh, uh, not very complex, you know, analysis, you know, when they don't ask, you know, due diligence, complex due diligence, or they do not, they focus more on business and less on aspects on ACG. However, how is your perspective, how we can integrate, how, how sustainability integrates in the private equity model in the region? Because it's, it's an important component to reach uh, a, a level of companies, medium to small size, which they might not have maybe access to all this kind of, uh, of financing, or, but through the, through the, through the, uh, through the uh, in, uh, use of uh, private equity funds who are interested in them and put a, a spot on this aspect. How, how do you see this in the, in the model of private equity? Does it work? Is it sustainable <laughs> for you? Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Thank you very much for this question. I think it works, it's sustainable, it can be, and it can work for majority of the market. You know, I, I believe that we have to look at it in, in two different layers. You know, first of all, the private equity itself. So the guys, investment professionals who are investing into some portfolio companies and the portfolio companies itself, you know, because um, I, I would say that the main main difference is that the private equity investment guys are much more closer to the capital. And uh, before of that, because of a lot of banks, because of a lot of institutional investors are talking about and asking questions, you know, are you investing into ESG compliant businesses or not? or do you care or not? You know, so these guys who are investing into portfolio companies are much, much closer to the capital who is pushing the ESG or sustainability in general. But once they are invest in portfolio company, you know, it's some something like within the management structure. Once you are having like tens of layers, you know, the the first um, idea or 
it will it can be lost uh, during communication you know because once you you communicate a very clear idea from one guy to another it's pretty clear but from the second one to the third one it can be it can be lost so i think that there are two these uh, different perspectives how to look at it in terms of uh, investment professionals it's getting definitely better because they are pushed to do that to think about it and, and to find the right right questions in terms of portfolio companies i cannot see it a lot and I would say that mainly reason for that is, as I mentioned before, you know, these kind of Central European and Eastern European markets are very small, very fragmented. So there is limited supply of deals, of great deals in general, not only ESG compliant. And because, because of that, it's still kind of relationship based um, countries or how, how to call it you know and it's not like that i would like to have the best board what we discussed before with helena and just for the record definitely i, I like women you know and what <laughs> what i what i what, 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 what i what i definitely believe that once <laughs> i believe that once you are looking for the best board obviously they are Plenty, plenty of women because women are like men; they are great, and so. <laughs> so, so uh, I, I, I mean, you know, uh, because of these relationship-based economies, uh, y you know, portfolio companies are much more focused on other things than diversity and the the best possible results because they just know someone and they are hire someone because they know him, you know, and that's kind of I would say the problem which. Um, for for bigger, more developed markets, they are in much better position fighting it, first of all, you know, and they are on the other side also much more successful in applying ESG and all the sustainable way how to, how to operate and how to deliver their results and IRRs and at the end of the day, the money to the institutional investors, you know. Uh, n not enough institutional investors, especially the worldwide or the global ones in, in these small fragmented markets, it means that I would say much, much lower focus on ESG and much, much less success, unfortunately. So that's how I can see it right now, nowadays. But it's changing and it's getting better, but slowly. If I may react on the f uh, exactly the idea of fragmented market. Because in my view, especially the at least the uh, low or lowest common standards are very important, especially in the case of fragmented markets. Because at least for our as a bank or financial institution or investors or I don't know even uh, investment companies, it's important to have some idea of standards. And if we have standards, then especially. Uh, for investment, the risk seen lower risk because if there are no standards or there are the fragmented standards, then it's tough to invest through the region. But once you have the common standards, at least the basic level, different countries have at the different level. But if you have at least the low standards, the the, the uh, minimum standard, then it's uh, less fragmented, at least from the lowest point of view. And in my way, they can improve the situation of the whole EU market because we will reduce the, uh, the fragmentation. And I have one point again to the women and the men. Uh, if uh, the Poland and France uh, regarding the uh, green issue, there would be women that will be decided they will do the common issue with the lower yields and higher and uh, higher over pricing and overbooked. This is my opinion. But the men decided to have a competition. Diversity, yeah. <laughs> this is the reason why we need a diversity. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, another exactly opinion, different perspective, another yeah? looking yeah. at the problem. So it's not about the competition. We should cooperate. Yeah. And I think it's key this for CE, cooperation, I think, and, and unity. I think it's very important. It was good. <laughs> uh, Todo, do you can want to add something on standards and taxonomy? Can I or maybe pick up on the cooperation oh. point? Um, and also just to highlight another piece of wonderful legislation that actually came out of the commission, which luckily didn't get debated too much, and it's working wonderfully, is uh, sustainable financial disclosure regulation. And actually, 
a, a lot that SFDR is doing, also on the private equity side, is even allowing venture capital private equity funds to give money to startups and actually integrate as part of the deal the data infrastructure and uh, the whole reporting process, the data collection that they need to then show that they're actually green. So by the time they become you know, publicly listed, you then, for example, have a generation of startups that actually know exactly how to do it and they're already uh, you know, ready for green bonds and for the capital market. Learning from that, it means that there is a possibility that we can actually, you know, even if politicians uh, in the region don't yet find this attractive because perhaps the average voter, again, getting back to the theme of education, you know, may not particularly win votes. It is possible. There is, we can still do a lot through actually working through the banking system, through the capital market system, and find a way to, through the deals, through the, the green bond issuance, to actually incorporate the data infrastructure that then shows us and gives us the clarity to say, actually, I can report uh, in accordance to the taxonomy. I can show how I'm reducing my emissions. And by the way, this region has a wonderful uh, history of also IT innovations. Also in my own uh, home country of Romania, we have wonderful internet. When I moved to the UK, I thought, what is happening? <laughs> my screen is not loading. Uh, but testament to that, we have one of the uh, largest data providers, Sustainalytics. Their second largest office is in Romania. And a lot of the analysts are Romanian and they're also spread a around the Central Eastern European region. It's just that they're not focusing inwards, right? They're serving the global asset owner market and asset manager market. So I think we have the talent. We just need to also connect the dots and understand how do we also look inward with a lot of these initiatives. Would be you know because we have we have ideas now. Sean mentioned a lot of you know projects and all, no we we all know what we're talking what we're talking about. But what is missing actually? Do you think it's something about you know tough leadership at the uh, thought leadership at the level of, of the C or the European Union? Do you think it's about politic issues? So how can we make this this thing work? Because we have ideas. You know there are people who have ideas. What is missing? What do you think is missing? Or what should Im what what can be improved? All change is led by pioneers, all change is. It does require leadership by various people, not just women, <laughs> but a lot of women, uh, in achieving this transition. So there's no doubt about that. You know, if you start understanding what the future looks like, it's a bit like knowing whether it's going to rain the next day, right? You plan accordingly and you act accordingly. Well, I think the most important thing I can say today is the future will be a huge change. We have started the revolution globally. It's underway. Europe is actually a leader, but it's not enough for Europe to consider changing Europe. It's not enough. We don't get out of this horrible situation we're in by just changing our own home. We have to lead globally. We have to support countries. Now, that also will mean a lot of export opportunities because 70% of the capex on infrastructure and urban development and so on in the next... 30 years is going to be an emerging market, 70%. That's, that's allowing for the rebuilding of our societies. And by the way, when I talk about that CapEx, I'm talking about roughly 9 trillion euros a year being invested in just the mitigation side, even before we tackle the resilience side. This is an enormous CapEx challenge and a CapEx boon, if we can make it work. And remember also, we, do not, we, we are not short of capital. We actually have the capital. The world is currently afloat in capital. We have great pools. We've been incredibly successful in the last 50 years of creating reservoirs of capital in Europe, in Japan, in the US, and China. It's just in the wrong place. It's not earning the returns it needs to be. Waiting, waiting for opportunities. That capital will have to be directed to the places where the opportunities lie. Now, either the capital is going to go eventually, with the support of credit enhancement by the European Union that's currently being discussed in the US to places like Nigeria and Indonesia. Or, actually, you know, it might go to companies that are exporting their technology, their ideas, their products to those countries too. And I think that's the opportunity here. You know, we have in, in Eastern Europe and Central Europe some economies, like Czechia's, that are, have made their fortune on exports. 
They have actually, that's the only way the economy's been able to survive over the last 200 years. First exporting within the Austro-Hungarian Empire and then... We just need to turn global instead of looking... You know, and there's been a lot of global exports already, but we just need to make it green. If we make it green, if we figure out what is needed out there and start exporting, we will make money. We will create wealth. And on the back of that will be investments in our solutions in export markets from our pension funds and insurance funds that allow us to finally be able to afford a pension when, well, Helena finally retires <laughs> in a few years' time. So in other words, this is a win-win situation. If we make this work, it'll be business and economic growth for our societies, but also long-term investment opportunities for the capital that will pay for our ageing society. This is really important. This is not just important because our children may not have a life if we don't address climate change. It's also important because this is the essence of the economic direction of the European Union. This is the essence of how we make our economy successful going forward. And take the faith in our hands, so basically, yeah? Pioneers, everyone. That's Pioneers, you. Pioneers, yeah. It's not all of us. If I may add uh, the, like the financial institution point of view. Uh, the bank or financial institution are is the place or are the places so where you are transferring short money into long money, into capital. And uh, uh, during this transformation, you need to reduce the risk. And if I may uh, ask maybe the regulators or the uh, leaders or the governments to help us to, to do or to improve the transition is to reduce the risk, the regulation risk. So... Uh, you may see that uh, there is uh, some, uh, would say, great idea, but once you are changing the condition for the business doing, like the regulations, you are changing this uh, subsidiary system, you have additional systematic risk. And what the financial institution needs to improve this transition is to reduce the risk that it's not uh, need to be there. So while you add the uh, global risk to uh, environment risk uh, to uh, here the war risk to additional risk like the regulation is or something like that. So in my view, I think the financial institution needs to have uh, the clear rules for doing their business to reduce uh, the so-called systematic risk from the side of the government. And there should be somebody who... Uh, would lead the change. So this is my like point of view from uh, somebody who is somewhere between the, the bank and also uh, the government, because I see the risk on both sides. Martin, what do you think it will take for the uh, private equity industry you know, to, to leverage this kind of capital you know, to, to move it to the more sustainable businesses? Do you see some you know, politics actions? They have some, or how do you see it? Yeah, uh, as I mentioned before, I think that first of all, you know, conti continue with the pressure from institutional investors because that definitely that works because, you know, uh, you as a private equity professional, you would like to have um, your committed money and once they are, you know, surrounded by some ESG kind of regulation or whatever, that you take it together, you know, so you are kind of think differently from the very a very first perspective, you know. And second of all, what I mentioned before as well, you know, I'm not super optimistic in terms of SMEs because I'm meeting on a weekly basis a lot of, you know, owners of um, like small and medium enterprises. And uh, to be honest to all of you, I still cannot see it that there will be any, any kind of pre pressure for them or just understanding, you know, what they are doing, how they can change it, you know, in terms of diversity, governance, also um, uh, the energy perspective and, and, and uh, in terms of uh, climate change. So there I would, I would say that there is still a long way to go and it's about all of us, you know, to push it, to understand it, to communicate it, over communicate it, very the same as you're doing uh, within the company, to say something, say it again, third time, and many times before it will be implemented, it will be understood, and it will, it will really happen. Okay, nice. Todor, some thoughts from uh, academic part? You think it's... Uh 
uh, on this you know uh, thought leadership from uh, uh, and actions that you know can push further you know the, all these initiatives i very much agree with Sean that you know the pioneers are in this room that you know we we can look at the leadership within ourselves however there are certain narratives that you know, some uh, some of parts of the lobby would use that to say to put this burden on the consumer to say that actually the consumers need to do this. And actually, I would like to maybe caution against that because it is actually a systematic change that we need. It, it you know you can't wake up in the morning and decide when you turn on the light whether it's green energy or not. You don't have to think about this. And and I think. Also to your point about pressure, I think we need to be better salesmen <laughs> around this. We need to win hearts and minds. And I, I'm a financial data scientist. And believe me, I tried. I, I compute, yeah, I kind of work uh, a lot with, with data, uh, with Nadia, with Bloomberg data. I love it. But that's not necessarily what changes hearts and minds. It changes my heart and mind because I'm a data scientist. But for everyone else uh, who is not necessarily doing our job day to day, they need to be won over uh, in a different way. And that may not be necessarily with, you know, just here are the numbers. So, so I think coming back to the institutional point, we are doing, um, you know, we are going in the right direction. The legislation is really unparalleled. If you think about the adoption around the world that EU legislation has spearheaded, but also the way it's designed, you know, the way that we think about do no significant harm, although it may be unusable in some respects, just the fact that we're able to say we're doing good to the climate, but we don't want to damage biodiversity, that's a huge conceptual win. We've never done it. We've never thought of, I mean, we've thought about it in this way, but we've never been able to put it in legislation. And I'm excited. <laughs> uh, although, you know, from an academic standpoint, I'm always like, oh, this is not good enough, not good enough. But, but the innovation is there. Okay. Innovation winning with a heart. It's a good one. <laughs> Uh, so we are closing the the end of the panel. Uh, I see some uh, signs. So I think we have to take some. Uh, if there are in, uh, some questions from the from the audience, uh, I don't receive on the on the electronic format. But if there is, uh, I think somebody there. If you, uh, yeah, but uh, I don't have the. Oh. Thank you, Ishan Sabo from KPMG, uh, C, Head of Sustainability Services. Maybe my questions would go to, to Sean, um, uh, because I'm very much interested uh, uh, what are the uh, additional uh, benefits of a CBI uh, compliant um, uh, green bond compared to a pure ICMA green bond principle um, a green bond? And second, uh, how do you see the value of independent uh, third party uh, assurance uh, on green bonds or any other ESG disclosures? Thank you. I'll quickly answer it because it's, architecture. it's an architecture question. We've established protocols that are getting independent review, builds confidence amongst investors and amongst consumers and people like us around the credentials. Because banks, you know, they're fabulous banks. But do they really know environmental criteria? I don't know. I mean, so we need the independent review, right? It's your job. And so we've established that as a protocol. And that's the key part of it. That's what we care about. At Climb Bonds, we care about where the money's going. We review every single bond of the market and put them in indices and so on. And we make, uh, we arrive at a view about the quality. And we look at the independent reviews. In fact, we've got an independent review. Certification is just a subset. It's a quality standard. There are some advantages because it uses a taxonomy. The broad market doesn't. Well, of course, the Europe now has a taxonomy, folks. So we'll be looking towards the European taxonomy, and Climb Bonds taxonomy will now work towards matching the European taxonomy. But it's a gold standard in the sense of the protocols associated. That's all. I, I, I'm going to pitch everyone doing certified climate bonds because they do have a greater level of scrutiny. But at the end of the day, it doesn't cover everything. There's a big place for independent reviews. And anyway, what do I care? What do I care is where the money's going. Is it actually making a difference? Is it going to a Paris Agreement consistent investment? And, and as an organisation, that's what we're really worried about, that it's contributing to creating a better world. And frankly, of course, that's what the investors now understand. They understand that creating a better world in the future isn't a nice, feel-good thing. It isn't a scoring system. 
It's actually a way of reducing risk. It's a way of reducing risk of implosion of economies. It's a way of reducing risks of implosion of portfolios. Because they've been told, in no uncertain terms, by the scientists, the data analysts and others, that they're heading into a firestorm. And unless these risks are mitigated, they're not going to be able to pay your pension when you retire. So that's why they want to support this market. So is any, do you want to answer anybody of you have more or it's, it's okay? We, we finish on the, on the you know, single thing of the bells. So it's quite, uh, uh, yeah, nice. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's like for looking, yeah. It's, so it's a moment to, to remember. It was very nice brainstorming with you. A lot of ideas. Thank you for the audience. We are here and the panelists are here for, uh, for the questions of after, we, after we finish. I think uh, the, recep the uh, sustainable terrace is now open, so we can go and enjoy. <laughs> uh, thank you again, and um, hope to, uh, to see you tomorrow and the following days in the, in the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you.